pray. Amen. 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 I had a discussion. Would you take some of the ring out of that? <clears throat> I had a discussion with uh, one of my uncles last night and one of my cousins uh, pointed out something that has happened really uniquely that has never happened before in the history of the United States. Last week, our Treasury Department, the way our country is financed is off of the Treasury Department selling T-bills to other nations. Other nations for years and years and years has waited in line to buy trillions of dollars worth of T-bills. And off those T-bills, they balance everything. And they get coal hot currency because I, basically America has been running on credit for a long, long time. Well, the first time in history, about three days ago, not one nation stepped forward to buy one T-bill from the U.S. Not one. China said, let's stop using the dollar. The nations have said, it's only worth three cents on the dollar. What are we doing? Let's all go with euro. Let's all let's do something different. They're worthless. Obama has warehouses full of euros here in the United States, and he says, "You know, that sounds like a good idea." That was his response. One world money I, that'll solve our problems. Now, the reason I'm throwing this out there, I do believe we're in the end times. One of those marks, the scripture says that the islands will be moved from their place. Well, the first time in history, man has it recorded that the whole nation of Japan, that island, moved from its place four feet. I praise God that they have the accurate instrumentation to know. Of course, you, if, you're, if you're blind and all that stuff, you might not be able to find your house. It's four feet from where it was. And my point in sharing this with you, if we're in the end times... It's going to take some faith. We're going to have to learn to live by faith. And faith, boy, I'm telling you, there's some fruit cocktail definitions out there that are deceptive at best and lead us astray so that we never find out what faith is. I find it interesting that the Lord asked the question, when I come... Will I find faith on the earth? Now, what does that imply? Not very many men have found it. If we're not finding it, then maybe our definitions are somewhat skewed as to what faith is. With that, shall we pray for some understanding as we go into the scripture? Lord, we humbly come before you. And your subjects, they are as deep as the universe and our finite minds cannot comprehend we are like children three years old looking at a mathematical equation that reaches to the sun and we can't even see the end of it so we need your help we call out to you we cry out to you for understanding we call out to you Holy Spirit to come and impart to us abilities we do not have, an understanding we do not have, just to be able to be put in the position to receive your truth, your revelatory truth, so that we might live it, not hear it, that we might know it and walk in it, not just see it and watch it pass by. Your word is precious to us, and it is the element that holds us in your presence. Your spirit-inspired word. So come and breathe upon us to receive. And breathe upon me. That your voice might be heard and not mine. In Jesus' great and powerful and precious name, I pray. Amen. Amen. We're in our study on spiritual gifts.
We're taking that from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. When it begins, it says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, and the word there used is pneumaticos for spiritual gifts, which has a particular brand of meaning. You remember in our last session, we went into the uh, charisma or charismata. And I look at charisma, we've looked at charis as being the great empowering for God or from God to us, leading us into a revelatory state of being able to be changed and transformed by the Holy Spirit till we're renewed into a spiritual being. It's just not free, unmerited favor. That's a false definition. That's men's definition. Matter of fact, if you want to get last week's notes, there were some really uh, uh, outstanding definitions in there that gave us an understanding of our limited capacity and an understanding of God's great capacity and his great ability to bring us into a capacity to receive from him. Pneumaticos is pertaining to the nature of the Holy Spirit. We've talked about that in our last session. I don't necessarily want to go into that in this session, but uh, how can I pass that by when we're talking about gifts of the Spirit? We must understand it's the, the gifts of the Spirit and their origin. You know, there's many who believe that the gift of faith is... I believe, I believe. Now, I don't know if you were a kid once, but I was. I was born at a very early age, and I happened to watch uh, The Wizard of Oz, and in The Wizard of Oz, the, uh, the, the, the brave lion was there in the, in the forest where all the wild monkeys were that fly, and boy, I was scared when I was, you know, about five years old, and I saw that, and I'm, oh, my goodness. And, 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 and there, they come up to a sign, and, and it says, do not pass by here and there are ghosts here and one of the guys said well I don't believe in spooks and then something happens and all of a sudden the lion starts I do believe in spooks I do believe I do believe I do believe now I can tell you just because you believe in spooks that's not the definition of faith just because you say I believe that's not God's definition of faith Jesus is asking a question will I find faith so I think we need to find his definition of what faith is don't you and when he says, when I find faith, it's not talking about our so-called faithfulness as far as our duties is concerned to relational functionality to Scripture. He's talking about the faith of God that Jesus was endowed with when he was here on the earth. He's talking about the faith of God that the Holy Spirit is willing to put in our hearts so that we can be into relational functionality with God, not just with Scripture. Is there a difference? Uh, there's a major difference. Now, don't get me wrong. The Scripture is God breathed. It's the Holy Spirit speaking to us through what he has said in times past so we can understand when the Holy Spirit begins to speak to us or when the Father begins to speak to us in the present time. It's a giant electron microscope that we put over everything that calls itself God to find out if it's from God. I quote to you again, Acts 17, 11, and they studied the scripture daily to find out if these things are true. You're supposed to be an astute student of the scripture, looking at everything that you're being taught or everything that you hear and weighing it against scripture as to whether it's truth or not. Because if it's not truth, then you're going to have some real problems. If it's not truth, then I need to be exposed as a false teacher. I would rather you expose me as a false teacher than me go to hell for being a false teacher. If I was a false teacher. But however, if the teachings are from God and they're revelatory from them and they're straight from Scripture. Now, I'm not in the check and balance. You are. Because if it's God speaking and it's his word, and what are you going to do with his word if he's really here and he's really enunciating and he's really putting something on the table and it's really God who is speaking it? Do you think there's any angel in heaven that will ignore what he has to say? So it places a great propensity upon us to listen and weigh carefully of what God might have to say, not a man. I know I used to sit in church and listen to men speak. 
And you know what that sounds like, right? Every one of you have heard it. It's on the, they, they recorded many, many sermons. And next time Christmas Charlie Brown comes on, if you want to hear one, just listen. It's... Right? You, you've heard that sermon. And that sermon is dead and it's lifeless and God is not in it. What we need is the breath of God in our presence. But if God's going to come down and speak to us, he expects a response from us. If he's going to reveal himself, reveal his nature, reveal his truths, he expects some sort of reply and answer to himself in accord with the truth and revelation that he gives out. Now, I'm, I'm sure that when... Uh, he sits on the throne and all the elders are bowed down and, and some of them, one, you know, two or three probably asleep. And one's polishing their fingernails and another one uh, polishing the crown. Yeah, I took it off. Here it is. And, and, and they get through all and say, oh, oh that, that, that was good. <laughs> I don't think they'd pass, do you? And rightfully so, because we serve a living God. Now, my point in giving you this rendition is because this... Uh, pneumaticos that we're talking about. We are talking about getting into a position that the Holy Spirit could move deeper in us, can fellowship more with us, and reveal the Father to us. Now, I don't know if you know this or not. I, I've, I've shared it with many of you um, probably at least 180,000 times that the Holy Spirit, Mr. Incognito, he won't even give us his name. And if he won't give us his name doing the magnificent things he does on the earth, how much more should we be invisible if God decides to use us as a vessel? But I tell you, there's another invisible player in this. And who's that? You're going to be awfully surprised. Jesus. What was his whole statement when he's here on earth? I want to show you the Father. I want you to meet the Father. I want you to hear the Father. I want you to speak to the Father. I want you to know the Father. I am the one going before you to establish a way into the Father's presence. I'm the forerunner going before you so you can stand before Him and I can stand beside you. I'm the high priest there in the heavenlies. I'm the one that's sitting on the throne with Him. Look up at the Father. Now, does that sound like someone that's trying to draw attention to themselves? I don't think so. So when we're talking about spiritual gifts... It's like becoming a true son. Our heritage changes. Our nature changes. The spiritual structure and makeup of our body now has to change to get into a position to receive more of him and less of us. To the degree that you empty yourself. And I, 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 th I think it was Jamie Buckingham that made this statement. He said, we're like a bucket full of gravel. You know, and we receive the Holy Spirit. Okay, Holy Spirit, I'm coming. I come and fill my bucket. <laughs> you know, he's wow. Okay, he pours himself in, and here we are. We got a bucket of rocks, and now rocks are the different issues in our life. Now, the Holy Spirit, he says, I'm agreeable with this, but you see this rock? Are you willing to throw it out of the pail? And the, what did the Holy Spirit come for? Bring conviction. He said, so I, yeah, I'm willing to give that one up. And I work with him and get it over the side and chunk it out of the bucket. Now the bucket goes down and I got that much more room. And the Holy Spirit says, yes. <laughs> and he pours that much more of himself in me. Now he comes to my next issue. That's separating me from more of the nature of God that I need. And issue by issue... He gets me to take my frogs and my rocks and throw them out of the bucket. And the more I do that, the more revelatory experience I can have with them. So this, uh, I, I, this, this, this walk with God, this, uh, this experiential fellowship in the Holy Spirit is not so much of us just being filled and, okay, my tonsils work and I got my angelic language. That's the birthing. Uh, that's the being birthed. That's a, what, if you're birthed, what are you? Now, come on, get up and run. Come on, dress yourself. Come on, feed yourself. Come on, let me get you, uh, you know, some books to read. Let me get you some. A baby doesn't have that capability, right? And unfortunately, we have an old crowd that says when you're birthed, go slay dragons. Go kick down the doors of hell. When we should be seeking out our Father to learn who we are and how to do things His way. 
The Holy Spirit came to lead us into the Father's presence, not to the gates of hell to kick them down. Let's not say Jesus didn't have that capability. That's not to say when we become mature, there might not be some assignment. But God's the one that chooses that. He didn't call us. Come and follow me and I'll give you an assignment. Show me that in the scripture. Come and follow me and I'll, I'll, I'll fill you so you'll be filled with great might and power and you can go do these things. Now, every, every person that went and did something for God were astute men and women of God that, that already had the character of God down so that the Holy Spirit could move freely within them. And the ones that didn't want to acquire that character, they wanted to purchase the Holy Spirit thinking they don't have to surrender their character. Simon the sorcerer. Well, I want the Holy Spirit. Lay hands on me. He's last in line, you know, and the line's getting finished, and they're not going to do it. Wait a minute. I'll give you money. I'll give you money. <laughs> you know, I got lots of money. And he was just told point blank. You have no part with God in this because your heart is wrong. Now, I believe that the Holy Spirit and his giftings are for everyone that belong to Christ and everyone that are willing to be a disciple and everyone that are willing to work out their salvation with fearing and trembling over their lifetime. I almost despise the use of the word eternal life. Reason being, being a good Southern Baptist when I grew up, it always threw me that's what matters, and it doesn't matter how I live between now and then. But the true definition of that word is perpetual life. Just like the showbread table, the table that was supposed to have bread in the temple or in the tabernacle, it was six loaves on one side and six loaves on the other side, and the six loaves on one side represented the six relational functionalities of our attitudes with man. And the ones on the other side, each one related to the six relational functional attitudes towards God. And you had to line the loaves of bread up perfectly. They had to be in their spot. They had to be baked right. Now, the reason I'm throwing that in is because if we want to come into pneumaticos, the first portion of it, of course, is us receiving the Holy Spirit. And the second portion is of him beginning to give us the angelic language because it's a language that goes directly to God for changing and improving us and bringing us into a state of mind to receive more things from God. And then there's this progression of getting to the point of the, the prophecy and all those different things, which we've... Talked about some of those. We will be covering prophecy in a, in a, future, in a future session in, in detail, what it is and what it is not. Just like we've covered word of knowledge, what it is and what it is not. Word of wisdom, what it is and what it is not. Oh, how the church needs these teachings. Because it, it would change the whole perspective of them and enable them to get into God's presence rather than just making a bunch of noise. Paul was dealing with a spirit-filled church that was just making a bunch of noise. They were, he even gives the example, they were sounding gongs. He did it gently, but he still did it. He said, you guys in there beating your own drum, making a bunch of noise. And he said, I wish you'd just even shut your meetings down. He says that point blank in the word. Why? It's because there was misuse, misappropriation of spiritual gifts. Now, if you have some spiritual gifts, praise God. Don't you want to learn how to hone those skills into the character of Christ so they can be used like Christ was used? Christ knew when to speak. He also knew when not to speak. Christ knew what to say because he could hear the Father. And he knew not to say what he had to say. Christ could read people's thoughts and minds and hearts. Now, everything that Jesus did, he said, I want you to be able to do the same things I've done. Matter of fact, I want you to do even greater things. It would be my honor if you do greater things. If we're going to do the things that he did, we must have the character in order to be able to do the things he did. Elsewise, we get this mixture, and mixture we've talked about. It, mixture is not acceptable before God. Now, 
there is this little waiting pool of spirituality that God brings us into that's filled with excitement and zeal. We kind of get our spiritual legs under us and, 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 and spiritual gifting begins to be birthed. And that, that can be a very safe, safe zone if the rules are set forth right. And we learn that I'm not God. And we learn to say, I, I think I'm hearing this from God. Can, would, would you mind, can, would you judge this? I, I need to know. Now, where we run into the problems in the waiting pool is somebody shows up. And they're a goat. That's the one that's going to climb the hill his way instead of God's way. And they're up on the side. And they, thus saith the Lord God. <laughs> If you had been tested and tested and tested. I believe that could be possibly done. And it would be effectual. But how ineffectual for a bunch of kids in the second, third grade, ninth grade, eighth grade, even senior high school. How immature for a kid that second year, third year, fourth year in college to stand up in the Senate of the United States. Let me have all your attention. I've got wisdom for God, from God for you. Do you think they'll listen? I don't think so. And rightfully so. So we, there's different stages of, of our spiritual growth. God wants to use us, but we're going to have to step back and learn how to do it His way so that it glorifies Him. His way so he'll truly move in our midst. If we do it his way, he'll truly speak to us, and we won't be in question. Why? The scripture says everything that goes on inside the church is supposed to be judged. And the church has stopped doing that. We're not supposed to judge the world, don't care what goes on out there. We're supposed to judge everything that goes on here. Now, those are teachings I've covered before, and I, I want you to look into the definition of, of pneumaticos. I've given it to you for on purpose and uh, please, please look into the definition. You guys that don't have the notes, don't let me get by. You make me email those to you. And last week's notes too. Now, I, I want to also uh, look at verse 7 here. Because it says, But to each one is given the manifestation of the Holy Spirit for the common good. How many? To each one. Are, are you one? Do you belong to Jesus? Does that include you? Now, this word manifestation is the word fanaru, which I've given you a definition below. It means make visible. It means make it conspicuous. In other words, to each one is given a manifestation of what? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is supposed to be manifested and made visible through you through some action he wants to do through you. Now, that should make you nervous. If you want to grab the microphone and... Yes, I'm all for that. Well, you probably wanted the microphone before you got filled with the Spirit or before you came to Christ, too. <laughs> That's just our human nature. That's the human nature of the playground and the person that wanted to lead the playground. That same person will enter church, and now they want to lead the church through their charismatic ways. But not so. The Holy Spirit is the one that's supposed to make a, a true manifestation of himself in our midst through you. Is it okay with you if he does that? Are, are you agreeable with him that he wants to use you? Because if you are, and you're nervous about it, and you got weak knees, and shaky hands, and a palpitating heart, you're a candidate. Scripture says, lift up weak knees and palpitating heart and speak as an oracle of God. That's one of the signs that God's truly trying to speak through you something. But it doesn't need to come forth as an oracle if you're a little child, does it? It needs to be come forth. And scripture says that everything that is shared with us, that we're accountable and we're supposed to share that with our leaders. It says, it, it says there's nothing that we receive that's a private interpretation. There's part of the problem is because the crazy maniac world has been taught, oh, I hear from God, I hear from God, and they don't want it judged. 
They don't want your opinion as to whether it's from God. They're not willing to take it to a list leader. And if the leader says, you know, I don't think that's God, and I think you're kind of in error in this, all of a sudden that leader is garbage and trash. So where's the check and balance for what they're so-called hearing? Because the scripture says everything's supposed to be judged. And who's it supposed to be judged by? That's not the bartender. That's not the guy that, that's out at the golf place. That's not the, the lady that's standing behind the counter that sells makeup. Who is it supposed to be judging these things? They're supposed to be spiritual men, real leaders that stand in God's presence. They're unable to stand in God's presence. They hear his voice. If they're unable to hear his voice, if they're not pure, if they're not functional with the Lord, and you're supposed to be looking under every vestment and saying, hey, pastor, would you roll up your sleeves? What you got under there? Where's your finances? Where's your, where's your, where's your heart? What do you do? Where, where's your pleasures? Where, you're supposed to be looking at everything about a person that calls himself a representative of God. And if they have the actions of men behind the scenes, then you're not following a representative of God. You're following a man. Because a representative of God acts like a representative of God when he's not in the pulpit. When he's not in the church, he acts like a representative of God. Now, let's suppose that you find one. Now, you have some spiritual giftings. And there's, there's, I have seen a lot in, in, in the ranks over the years of men and women repenting from abuse of the gifts. Matter of fact, I have seen God's spirit lift off of whole churches. Something that began in the church, maybe two or three thousand people, they truly were in the presence of God. And I have seen the presence of God lift completely from churches, totally. And he said, I'm not going in there anymore. I will not have any part with it. And why? Because of the abuse of the gifts. It's one thing for us to abuse each other. It's another thing for us to abuse the Holy Spirit and Jesus. Now, you know I believe in prophecy, and we've had many, many, we've talked about all the mega miracles that, that God has, uh, you know, done. Uh, you've, you, many of you have experienced those miracles. Many of you have some really heavy-hitting experiences that are true. But even those, we need to judge even at a later date with more truth, do we not, to make sure they were from God. Because with the actual advent of people making statements that are not of God, we, we kind of get lost in, well, what is of God? So this fanaru means that the Holy Spirit wants to actually manifest himself using us. It's of things of God that are accostive, of that relating to or being grammatically the case stated plainly that marks a direct object of a word in action being made visible. You want me to repeat that in English? I know that was in the English dictionary, but let's, let's get out the eighth grade model. <laughs> Second grade model. Second grade model, it means that the Holy Spirit will manifest him in self in a way relating to something through a grammatical discourse, right? Grammatical means he's speaking. It can be in the rhema, it can be in the logos, through you about something that is right in our midst, which is a direct, op direct object of what he wants to speak about, but now he's putting it into action of something that needs to take place about that particular item. Does that make sense? I got one head shakes yes and 47 head shaking no. <laughs> okay, let me put it in a little bit easier way for us to understand it. The Holy Spirit... He knows what he wants to say. He knows how to state it plainly. He has an objective that he wants to actually make happen in our midst. So he comes upon you and he begins to speak to you about that objective. He may not give you the full insight. Jesus received words from the Father that gave him insight to the objective that the Holy Spirit wanted to accomplish there on the spot. Did he not? And then that's uh, uh, like the rich young ruler comes to him. Jesus offered him to be the 13th apostle. 
come and follow me. I don't know of many others that he offered that to. And he's the only one recorded in scripture that turned him down and went away sad. But Jesus knew objectively through the spirit of what was going on in the young man's mind and heart and all the things he was entangled with and the great wealth that had him by the throat and his religious propensity. And this is God standing there, not trying to be harsh, but trying... Do you think he was earnest and serious if God standing there and said, go and give away all that you have and come and follow me? Was that a real invitation from God? It was. It was a sincere invitation. Jesus didn't do anything insincere. It was a sincere invitation that the young man was the object. Jesus gave the word and action to bring truth to the young man, which was a manifestation of the Spirit through Jesus. Now, do you understand that? We're getting closer, aren't we? <laughs> I, I, I love the, these, these things called manifestations because there's real things that we can see and account in the spiritual realm of God that relate to the physical realm here on earth. Jesus' glory that was manifest here. His glory, his disciples and apostles and those close to him got to see his glory. In other words, the, visita the visitation or the doxa of God coming and resting upon him, such as the Mount of Transfiguration. He literally turned glowing white, just like Moses. He literally was in the Father's presence. They literally could hear the Father, and they could see Moses, and they could see Elijah. With all them standing there, they're seeing a manifestation of the Holy Spirit bringing into their understanding and mind a real physical thing that's happening in a real world here on this earth that somehow coincides with the spiritual world because the spiritual world is the one that's real, God's spiritual world. Our world, it says, it's passing away. It will be done away with. So Fanaru, this manifestation, it's visible, conspicuous things of God that are supposed to take place through you by the actions of the Holy Spirit. I'd like to read a couple of passages of Scripture to you. 2 Corinthians 2.14 Now thanks be unto God which always causes us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the Savior of his knowledge by us in every place. In the Greek what that says is that the triumph in Christ makes manifest the Savior. What is manifest the Savior? Makes the Savior appear. This word, his knowledge, is highlighted in your notes. In the Greek, is, and I, I love this, it's how to. Yes. How to gnosis. How to means his personal presence with his personal mind, his personal heart, his personal body being present with his personal knowledge that's in his mind being present. Do you catch the significance of that? So when it says that this triumph in Christ, it's that Christ would be manifest where he appears. Remember in Titus, he, ta he talks about that uh, the great hope of his appearing in our midst. Now we're talking about the manifestation of Jesus and his how-to gnosis. His, it's you, Lord. Oh, you're personally here. Uh, you remember John, the, the, the one that was 
he, he, he meets Jesus and his eyes were, and his hair was white and, and, and he was glowing and he, he, he wanted to fall down like he was dead. He's, he's meeting how to. <laughs> he's meeting Jesus, right? In, 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 in chapter 1 in the book of Revelation, he's giving us a revelatory look at Jesus. He's having a how to gnosis. He's having the revelational part of Jesus in person when it that how to is used they translated it his but in Greek it's how to and the true translation is 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 what I've told you it's it's him showing up in person and if he's showing up in person then his knowledge is available in every place now it goes on that that translation of every place it mean, it means his knowledge is now totally surrounding a situation now, the reason I'm telling you this is because a manifestation of the Holy Spirit is supposed to incorporate a how-to so that we can enter into the knowledge of the how-to, the knowledge of him standing. If Jesus is standing here, don't you realize he had something to say about you? He has something to impart to you. If he is here then he has something he wants to reveal to you on a personal level, not just to somebody else. And that knowledge is different than man's knowledge. It's a how-to knowledge. I like that. See, I, we need to write a book. It's how-to knowledge. <laughs> how-to. Now, the reason I'm putting this in for you is because he comes right back and he makes this statement, verse 17. So we're not like the, the rest of the guys that do the preaching out there. We're not peddling the word of God like them as from their own sincerity. But we're speaking to you as from God. We speak in Christ before his presence and in the sight of God when we're speaking. Now there's some of that how-to that they're seeing in the sight of God now relaying information to the individual that's listening. Now, do you understand that statement? If Jesus is standing there, and I'm not spiritually conscious enough to realize it, their abilities to hear him in their how-to in the Greek and to receive knowledge from him, now they can express that knowledge from him to me that will bring me into an understanding that Jesus is standing here and hopefully can hold me in their arms and pass me into his arms so I can become one that has had a how-to experience. Did I lose you in this? Okay. I love it that the Lord, when he speaks, he speaks so plainly. And it's all about him. And the more I get lost, the more I get found. <laughs> now, there, there's more explanations in there. Uh, John 21 and 14. This is now the third time that Jesus was manifested to the disciples. John 1 and 2. After that, he appeared and was manifested in a different form. Ah, I love that. You know why I love that? Because the Holy Spirit can manifest Jesus to us in many forms. If you're curled up in a ball in the corner and life has beat you down, the Holy Spirit can manifest a Jesus to you that can come and hold you and draw you out into a safe place. It looks past all the sin and all your hurts and all your wounds and, and just wants to bring some healing because he realizes, you know, you got blood everywhere and that's your liver over there and that's your heart over there and you don't need any instruction right now. I just need to put you back together. <laughs> so I, I need that manifestation of Jesus. Now there's a manifestation of Jesus like John the Revelatory had. Here's a mature man. It's got all of his parts in the right place, spiritually, 
He's got a complete understanding of walking with Jesus, knowing Jesus. He has an understanding of knowing the Father and hearing the Father, an understanding of being filled with the Spirit and walking in the Spirit, doing all manner of miracle. But now, his how-to is much, much more revelatory because God wants to talk to him about the condition of the church and God's heart and attitude towards the condition of the church. Not, his attitude wasn't that towards John, was it? It was towards what Satan was doing, towards what Jezebel was doing in the church, towards the failures of men stopping the how-to experience. You remember every one of the letters that are written, it's because you stopped the how-to experience. You remember the, the Lego that starts off, he's, he's saying in the Greek, I'm standing here. My feet are on fire. My eyes are ablaze. And then he starts in, I have this against you. You stop doing this. You won't listen to me anymore. And you tolerate this sin in your church. And then he ends up everyone with every one of the letters because they can't sense him in a how-to experience anymore. He ends up in every one of the letters. Now, if you have any spiritual ears left on your head, listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying. So they had either lost some maturity or didn't gain into maturity, so they were still having to listen through the Holy Spirit, which implies in our maturity the Holy Spirit wants to take us into Jesus' presence. Now Jesus has some training for us. But there's another place beyond that which most of us in Pentecostal land have missed. The Father waits. We're supposed to be being carried into the Father's presence and we've got to look like Jesus, smell like Jesus, and act like Jesus. We've got to come to the maturity of Jesus. We need his mind, we need his heart, and we need his resurrected body to be able to walk in and stand beside the Father and get up in the lap of Jesus so that we can look over and see the face of our Father. Because your whole identity is hidden in the Father. Jesus got his identity from the Father. And he makes the statement that he will come to us and give us a new name written on a white stone. And every one of us need that experience. It's a how-to experience in Jesus. Now, with that, and the reason I'm laying this is because if we're going to talk about faith, it's faith in the real thing. It's faith that Jesus can manifest himself. It's faith that Jesus can speak to us. It's faith that the Holy Spirit is still in operation. It's faith that God is on the throne and waiting for us to have interludes with him in our functionality with him for the revelation of him will come that his kingdom is so much more realer than this kingdom that we don't want to be here anymore. We just want to be in his presence. And I'm not talking about being an escape artist. There's too many weenie escape artists. Oh, I just soon die. And the Lord says, I don't want you to die. I want you to live for me. <laughs> no, I want to die for you. No, Jesus, Jesus, I did that. Now live. Live the life. Do it. And then he says, okay, I, I, I'm going to give you more of the Holy Spirit if you, if you want it. And we go, well, I don't know, I'm pretty, pretty mad about this stuff. And, and, you know, and you know, the Holy Spirit comes up and, you know, Jesus sent me. Well, I'm still pretty mad. At him. Well, come on. Why you, man, the Lord sent me. I, I'm here to give you some more. But <laughs> oh, no, I want to stay where I'm at. You know, I'm, 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 we'll talk about it. <laughs> and we're resisting. We got our rocks in our bucket and we got a big rock and we don't want to let go of that big rock. But we're just willing to get rid of that character of us and get it out of the bucket. Now, more of Jesus' presence and more of the Holy Spirit can come into the pale. And the more of him that we have, the more pureness that's in there. The more pureness that's in there, the more strength there is for him to help us lift the rocks and get them out of the bucket. Until finally, that pail is completely empty of all our dysfunctionality, all of our brokenness, all of our hurts, all of our wounds, all of our angers, all of our frustrations about the past, all of our hates. And we've also got all those people that did us wrong out of the bucket. <laughs> you know? And we're not playing that old album, uh, She Did Me Wrong song thing, or He Did Me Wrong song thing. That don't play in the bucket no more. Instead, it's hallelujah. <laughs> you know, 
<laughs> and, and, and with that, uh, let, let's, let's, let's go on here. Now, little children abide in him, so that when he manifestly appears, where does he manifestly appear? And little children, they want to abide in him. Our mindset has to be one of simplicity and one of not puffed upness and not one of, I know I have studied scripture for 3,000 years, you know? I, Liar, liar, pencil on fire. <laughs> you know, I, when we got that mindset, we're not a little child. And so he says, now my little children. So take on the mindset. Lord, I, I, I don't know anything. I mean, if Satan doesn't even know the deep things of God, who are we to say we know? And who are we to cop an attitude and try to force somebody else to do something with our theology and our actions? He said, well, children, abide in him. So what's your objectivity? Abiding in him. Stop tinkering with your neighbor and stop trying to be the fix-it man for them. Instead, <laughs> it be, abide in him. That's what you're supposed to do. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling and abide in him. Now, you tell me you can abide in somebody or in him with your finger stuck down somebody else's tonsils to make an adjustment on their teeth, you know? Let me pull that tooth out of your mouth. And, and God said, wait, wait a minute. You're not a dentist. Come over here. Come on, stop that. <laughs> Come over here. <laughs> you know, abide in me. <laughs> so he wants us to abide in him. And, and so that when he manifestly appears, what happens if we abide in him? What happens if we're a little child of his? Manifestly appears. When that happens, now we have confidence. If, if, if the Lord's willing to manifest himself to us and keep in mind I'm talking about Thanaru for a reason is because in us being used in the gifts of the spirit what's the use of that unless Jesus gets manifested and lifted up right he said, if I get lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. So the purpose of us operating in the gifts is either to bring healing so Jesus can see, uh, heal broken legs so people can get up and walk with Jesus, take fingers out of ears so people can hear Jesus. <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Tell me about it. <laughs> yeah, sometimes the fingers are buried more in the ears than the, the, there's no ear problem. It's just we got our fingers. We don't want to hear it. <laughs> I'm, I'm resistant to that. I, I, I know. I've been doing this for years. I know. Well, look what you've been doing for years. Do you know? Are you able to walk with him on a consistent basis? Do you have his character? Is the sweetness and gentleness of Jesus within you? Because if the sweetness and gentleness of Jesus is there, now we got the fruits of the Spirit, which now we got some evidence that there's some gifts of the Spirit. Because I'm telling you, the gifts of the Spirit really don't mean anything unless there's the fruits of the Spirit. And we bear that out. Remember, he said, what good is it to be this, this clanging gong if you don't have love? And what is love? One of the manifestations of the fruit of the Spirit. So it does no good to have the gifts of the Spirit if you're not into the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is one that brings validity that you can truly operate in the gifts of the Spirit. Does that make sense to you? I love God's little check and balance system to see, is you be my kid today? Oh, yes, Daddy. Yes, Daddy. And he said, you being my kid today? And I, I have done a theological review of your academic <laughs> scroll that you have here that you sent me. Oh, how manifest it was to me. Oh, great God. <laughs> Holy Spirit, <laughs> he needs to be thrown in the pit. <laughs> it, you know why? When you're in the pit, there's no one down there but you. You have an encounter with yourself. And you learn, I can't walk with God. And if I'm not walking with God, he's not manifest himself, I'm in the pit. There's these pits all over planet Earth. It's where we resist God. Sometimes we dug those pits ourselves. They were for somebody else. 
<laughs> I'm going to fix that person. <laughs> you know, I can't stand the government's plotting against me. You know, digging that pit to bury the government. <laughs> this person or that thing or life or whatever those things are, you're just going to end up in there because we're supposed to trust God. We're supposed to believe God. We're supposed to be filled with joy. We're supposed to be filled with peace. We're supposed to walk in his presence. And I don't give no time for no shovel to be digging no pit somewhere for somebody else or something else, does it? So if our mind is askewed, you tell me where Jesus ever spoke about the Roman government and how wicked they were. You show me where he spoke about anything except his father and how to come into God's presence in the kingdom of God. He wasn't concerned about those silly things. And if we want to stay in God's presence, we can't be in concerned about those. If we want a manifestation of fanery to take place. Now, the, the reason I'm talking about fanery is because if we're going to talk about the nature of the gift of faith. Now, see, faith, uh, pistos or pistos, is something that comes from God. Now, I didn't say this in the, in the last thing. I'm ahead of myself a little bit, and I, 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 want, to, I want to make this statement. There's a passage of Scripture that goes on down there in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 13. Uh, verse 33, it says, For God is not a God of disorder. So we need to, if we're going to operate in the gifts, find out what his order is. Not your order, not my order. What's his order, right? I, we can all work with that, I think. I think we all want to do what the Word says and the way God wants it done. So if it's not God's way, God's will, if it's not God's will done God's way, then it's disorder. And that includes the use of these gifts. Now, it'd be disorder for me to give up and get a prophetic, give a prophetic word of, of, of uh, uh, you, you know, of, 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 of something. If I... Don't do it. And I'm not filled with love, and I'm filled with hate, and I'm filled with envy. And I'm, I, I've heard much prophecy given envy. I've heard much prophecy given out of wanting to be the star. I've heard much prophecy, and even sometimes somebody trying to steal the show. I know, I'll read this passage of Scripture. It always blows them away. The scripture says where there's selfish ambition, every evil will abound. So we must understand if we want Jesus to fanaru in our presence, I can't have a display of my nasty nature, me running nude to the crowd and saying me, myself, and I, and him stick around. It, it doesn't work. And that's really how lewd crude and rude it is for our flesh man to speak if the spirit of God is willing to give us a how to manifestation of our Lord Jesus or of himself would you agree with that now <clears throat> I, if anyone thinks he's prophetically or spiritually gifted let him acknowledge what I am writing you is the Lord's suggestion. No? It's not what it said. What does it say? Ah, a little stronger there, huh? That's the Lord. Uh, he's got his finger down your tonsils and said, you better understand this. He stings with me. And if I'm standing there, it better be done in a certain way. And he says, if he ignores this, he himself will be ignored. That is a, that is a, that is a statement that ought to run up the shivers of our spine, because it means every spiritual being in heaven and on earth, including God Himself, will absolutely ignore you. Now, if our purpose is to get Jesus to manifest Himself, and I do something out of the character and nature of Jesus, I just made it so that the Holy Spirit would totally ignore me. And Jesus will totally ignore me. I, I, I think that's too great a risk for me to run from my flesh to want to run its mouth when the Holy Spirit starts the time clock. 
my little heart begins to beat sometime when I come down and I know we're going to have a service and 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 the Lord's coming. He comes walking in and and it's just like he punches the time clock. I, I and and he says, "This is my time. You better not waste one word of it. You better not say one thing about yourself one thing what you know it matter of fact most of me he won't even let me kid around he's, it's my time clock you're on my time and, and 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 the biggest problem is people don't spend enough time in god's presence and do you realize you would not go to a movie theater and walk out of there with a 30 minute show thinking you got your money's worth you would not walk out if it was an hour long you would say, wait a minute, something's wrong here. You'd not walk out if they just showed some flicks and some commercials and, and, and a little, uh, well, uh, you know, some kid took his camera around. You, you, you'd want your money back. But yet we don't have sense enough when it comes to spiritual things to realize that when we come walking into the God's presence and we want a fanaroo experience and a how-to experience and a manifestation where the Holy Spirit will not only use us, but speak to us transform us and change us and bring us into a mindset of how to hear God. It is the sweetest thing on earth to hear our God's voice speak to us. It is washing, it is cleansing, it is revelatory, it is the acknowledgement of the Holy Spirit. It's almost whenever I am used of God, it's like he says, you are my son. Now speak this, this away. He will not let me, he will not let me moderate it. He will not let me add to it. He puts his emotion in it. He puts his, 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 his it's like his body becomes, I, I, I don't just see it, I feel the extension of it. We're supposed to so much come into the how to experience if we're going to express what God has to say. That his emotion, his heart, his mind is in the midst of it. So when men walk away, they say, wow, I met God. Not a man. That includes you being used in the gifts. I've seen some people moved upon in their heart. All of a sudden is one like Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, crying out to God. And it causes a breaking within all of us because that particular move of what the Holy Spirit wanted to do was expressed with the emotion of the Holy Spirit but not in insaneness not in where a person can't speak it must be intelligible it must be precise the clock is ticking so that when you're receiving something from God Go ahead and work through your emotion, emotional part and your pauses and all that stuff and get it condensed down of what he's trying to say and then say it simply, softly, and in a short manner without trying to teach about it. The more you try to teach about it, the more you try to analyze it, the more you try to add to it, the more you put water in it and the less of God that we can see. So let's come back to faith, pistis. Jesus, his apostles, ask him, how long have we been going, Tristan? An hour. An hour. Man, I'm telling you what, this is tough. <laughs> the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. Have you said that to God? Have you truly come to Jesus and said, Lord, I want to get in a relational position with you? And I beg of you, I ask you, I, I, I need an increase in my faith. Listen to what the Lord has to say. If you had faith like a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. But that's not all he had to say. Same subject matter. And he's still speaking and still rolling up his lips. Now, what was the question? Increase our faith. Now, most of the sermons I've heard stop right there. Well, you just need the faith of a mustard seed. And here's what it grows. It grows up into a big tree, the biggest thing in the garden. And 
But I, I've never had the other part heard that I, I, I've never heard it added to it. But Jesus is speaking. This is God speaking. So it has to do with our faith. And it would obey you. Which of you, having a slave plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he comes in from the field? Now, what's the, what's the example Jesus gives? They're asking for faith, and he stated, number one, you got to be a slave. And you better be plowing in the field, and you better be tending sheep. He goes on, and he says, which of you having a slave plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he comes in from the field, come immediately and sit down to eat? No one, right? You hired you, or you owned the person and their job is you go work in the field and you come in and you, I want your, your other duty is to fix supper and after you fix supper and, you, and you, after you serve and after you wash the dishes and, and after you do this, right? But will he not say to him, prepare something for me to eat? Now that's Jesus coming in and saying, okay, if you want to get into this relational functionality of deeper faith with me, number one, be a slave. Don't tell me what you're going to do. You do what I say you're going to do. And you be busy in the field and you be busy with my sheep. That's your lifestyle. And then when you come in from that, the next thing that's on your agenda is you prepare something for me to eat. Now, where do we do that? The sweet-smelling sacrifices and aromas of our hearts and our praises and our worship. We don't become frustrated. Paul worked 24-7 for God. And when he got through ministering with people, guess where he went? He went and worshipped the Father. He began Jesus, what did he do? He was out laying hands on all day long, healing people all day long, endless, endless lines, not one walking away that was not healed in many, many areas. And after he gets through, he pulls away and he prepares something for the father to eat. He prepares his heart and mind. And, oh, Father, your word has gone out strongly over the earth. Oh, I, I, have, I have done everything that you've asked, Lord. Oh, Lord, I, I pray for them. I lift them to you. Will you go before and, and tomorrow and, and show me what you want done? I mean, he, he's a man here on earth. And now he is letting God feed upon his desire to be in service to his father. Do you, do you see the picture of that? Oh, number three or four or twelve, whatever it is. <clears throat> Prepare something for him to eat. Make it your lifestyle to be about his business. And I love number four, and properly clothe yourself and serve me while I eat and drink. If we're willing to do this, now the Lord says, and afterward, you may eat and drink. Now, whose presence is that person going to get to eat and drink in? The Father's presence. I mean, I'd gladly be one of the slaves in heaven if I got to sit at the Father's table after I got through preparing the meal. Do you realize what an honor that would be? I'm not a celestial being. He's got millions and trillions of sons and daughters. Most of us are going to be way out there in left field. Do you realize what it would be like to prepare a meal and hand it to him, how close you would be? It's the all essence of your heart of, Lord, here I am, like, like Mary. Here I am. Be it unto me as you would see fit. Handmaid. And he says, afterwards you may eat and drink. So with that comes the eating and drinking of the revelatory processes of God. Remember Jesus? He's at the well. They go off to buy food. When he comes back, he's been in the Father's presence. And he says, I have food that you know not of. Why? Because he labored and did the Father's work. He labored and served the Father right there in the midst when this lady was there. He's tending the sheep, still serving the Father. And when he gets through and the disciples arrive with food, he says, I got, I got food. I don't need that. I got foods you don't know about. He does not thank the slave because he did things which were commanded. Does he? 
I, you know, many of us expect some form of gratitude or something from God in our service to Him. If you expect that gratitude, He's going to be looking and thinking, well, you want me to thank you for letting you do something for me? I, I can't imagine some angel... That, I'm standing in the thank you line. I haven't received thanks from him yet. I've been on 600 missions. and <laughs> You know, I'm going to get in the thank you line. Now, I'm sure that line leads somewhere, and I don't want to know where. <laughs> God will fix that little problem. There was a whole parcel full of those angels, and they got cast somewhere else from, from his presence. So, So, you too, when you do all things which are commanded you, say we are unworthy slaves and we have done only what we have ought to have done when we've done everything right we've only done what we should have done and why should we expect God to give us for some reward for not doing something we shouldn't have been doing in the first place right why should we expect it? Now, Satan comes in and deceives us like we got some sort of... We had not even got into any reward yet. But the reward is his presence. A reward is his table. A reward is that banquet table of fellowship that he offers. And in that banquet table and in that, it's spiritual food now. With that spiritual food, my body begins to take on a spiritual state. So they can truly operate in spiritual gifts. That's something that's been missing in the charismatic realm. We've not taken time to let God give us the food that we need and get in the right posture so that we can take on spiritual nature to house the spiritual giftings and spiritual abilities. A carnal man does not know what to do with spiritual gifts. But yet we've been getting everybody in lines and burping them like babies and saying, that's Jesus, and okay, what's your spiritual gift? And all that is is us wanting advancement when we're supposed to be desiring the presence of our God. We're supposed to be looking for a fanaroo, how-to, experiential, revelational fellowship with God. So I hope in our next session... We'll get into the definition of the gift of faith. With that, shall we pray? Lord, how gracious you are to speak to us and, and bring some of your revelatory process that's so simple. You just put it down in plain, plain writing. We desire to get in that position, Lord, not just to receive gifts, but, oh, Lord, to be in a spiritual state to know what to do with them. It would be pleasing to you in, in your order and your functionality so that we could be useful in your kingdom with your truth abiding in us not just pouring through us. Cause your word to be planted in us, Lord. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen? Amen. Before we get back into worship, if you need to leave, that's fine. Uh, but I want to give you an opportunity to respond to the word, and then we're going to do a little bit more worshiping. Uh, so, balls in your court. Out of this study, remember, this is not re-preach the word. This is not about what happened yesterday that you can associate with what happened now. It's how did the Lord speak to you? What word did he give you? What truth did he give you? That you want to hide in your heart so that the enemy doesn't steal it from you. Remember the three S's. Speak simply. Make it short. And make sure it's of the Spirit. That's the starting test. If we're going to move in spiritual gifts, we're going to have to also control ourselves in the midst of Fanaru, right? So the ball's in your court. Now, nobody wants to raise their hand after that. No? <laughs> yes, Gail, we need a microphone.
I have it. I have it already. Oh, cool. You want to turn that camera around there? You don't have to. Yes, please do. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I was just thinking about um, the faith and, and, um, and obedience. And I am so not a slave. I mean according to what scripture is. I mean, I was just thinking about how much gratitude I think I need every time I serve or, and I, and I don't, I don't think I do it for that motivation or anything, but, but sometimes I, um, well, anyway, I go off on that a little bit, but, um, I just, I just kind of wanted to repent of that. I think just, I want to serve the Lord without gratitude as my motivation. Lord, you hear your daughters of Zion request. Now I ask you, Lord, out of not only her confession, but that you enable her. That her heart would be filled with a desire and passion to serve you. Just out of the simple process that she gets to sit down with you. And to receive more revelation from you. Give her hope of this. And thank you for revealing it to her. And set her free and wash and cleanse. If there was anything in there, Lord. As only you can. In Jesus' name. Anyone else? Rosie? Um, I'm with Gail. I... I... I want to confess before the Lord that I have not been the servant that I should be. That I, I think it, the the little bit that that I should do is too much for me. And and because I've chosen to do certain things because I want to do it, and and I don't have time to do just what I'm supposed to do just what is required of me and yet I still expect some kind of um, gratitude for for what little I do and I just um, I just want to lay everything at his feet and only do his will and only serve him not myself Lord I thank you for bringing repentance now I ask you to bring your washing and cleansing as only you can. We desire to be functional servants of you. Forgive us for holding wrong ideas about this. What's at stake is your manifest presence. And oh, how we desire that. Anyone else? Tristan? You know, I think that that illustration got us all in some way. For me, I just, I rush off and I feed myself first. <laughs> I don't I don't get my stuff done out in the field, and then I don't come in and prepare what I need to for the Lord. I just make sure that I, you know, I take care of number one sometimes pretty well. I just wish that number one was Jesus more often. But I'd like to purpose uh, Lord's used that, that illustration a lot lately for me. And I just I feel that's real confirmation. The Lord's calling me to be more faithful as a servant. Lord, yeah. receive my brother's confession. Wash and cleanse him. Put new desires in his heart as only you can. For service unto you. That he might have the manifest how-to on a continual basis. Anyone else? Now let the Lord speak to you. Last call. Jackie. I love the, um, just, I'm so glad you, you spent more time um, helping us understand that fanaroo or that manifestation. I, it, it just was so, it's so awesome to know that if Jesus 
want in the Holy Spirit want to they he wants to manifest himself to us then he has a purpose in that and he has something to say to us and he has something to do in us and it's not just a woo 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 little moment but he has he's he is purposeful in meeting with us um i, I just that's just awesome to me and as as people were um were um, confessing and, and repenting um, those attitudes of their hearts. I just had this picture of because I was I was as I was praying too with people. I saw this this um, I just thought, Lord, you there's there are, you have so many servants in this room. I mean, I, y'all are just amazing group of people in serving one another and having such a heart towards that. And I was kind of going, oh, Lord, but I know that they're confessing these things, but, Lord, you know what's there. And, and it was almost like I could see that he was, he, there was this um, kind of dusty top, and I just saw him take his hand and wipe off that dust, and it was the most transparent, beautiful gold underneath and I, I felt like that's what he was saying was this. He said, we're just giving, I'm just giving you guys a good dusting. I'm just mo- removing, you know, like he's raking off more of the dross on the top of the gold. And it's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Amen. Amen. Shall we worship the Lord now?